Today's episode of True Crime with Kendall Ray is brought to you by ThreadUp. When shopping at ThreadUp, you can use the code TCKR for an extra 40% off your first order. And thanks to the support of ThreadUp and the support from all of you, I'm able to make a donation this week to the Anti-Predator Project in honor of Valerie Tyndall. To learn more about the Anti-Predator Project or make a donation yourself, you can click the link in my bio. Going into 2024, I am challenging myself and you to shop more sustainably. And one of the ways that you can do that is by thrifting. And a much easier way to thrift is through ThreadUp. I have found so many great items through ThreadUp. I think what I'm most excited about in my latest purchase is my Key Australia sunglasses. This is the Desi Perkins collab. And Key is one of my favorite brands. Now these babies have an estimated retail value of $102. I got them for $40.99. Then I also decided to pick up some pieces for my daughter because children's clothes can actually be really expensive. I got my daughter this adorable rainbow stripe dress from Primary Clothing. It retails for $36. I got it for $15.99. You can get started with ThreadUp by using the code TCKR and that will be linked below as well for 40% off your purchase, which is awesome because the prices are already so low, so you can really get a lot. And of course, thank you so much to ThreadUp for sponsoring today's episode and supporting my content. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to True Crime with Kendall Ray. I'm so happy to have you joining me here today to discuss yet another case. And if you're new, then welcome. Be sure to click subscribe. So today's case is very difficult to talk about. It was highly requested in my members only form. And it's one that I have been following for a while, wanting to wait for the right time to talk about it. And now that an arrest has been made, I feel that it's the right time because justice still needs to be served and hopefully that is right around the corner. Before we jump into this case, though, I do have an exciting announcement. I need to give you guys a huge shout out, a huge thank you for all of your donations towards our end of the year NECMEC campaign. We ended up raising over $62,000, which Mile Higher Media has matched, which brings us to, what's the math on that? A little over $124,000 through that matching campaign, which is incredible. So that brings our campaign total to $418,711, which is incredible. And I just know that we are going to hit half a million dollars in this upcoming year, which is huge. I'm so proud of you guys. And again, just thank you for supporting my shows because you know, without your support, this wouldn't be possible. NECMEC is super grateful. And Michelle Delon, the CEO of NECMEC, wanted to send you guys a little video message. Hello, I'm Michelle Delon, President and CEO of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I'm here for the second consecutive year to say a very special thank you to Kendall Ray, her fantastic team, and every single one of you who contributed to her 2023 Holiday Match Campaign to help support our great organization. Because of your amazing kindness, over $62,000 was raised, and every penny was generously matched by Kendall Ray, totaling over $125,000 raised. Please know that these donations support our life-saving programs and services. At NECMEC, we believe every child deserves a safe childhood, and I'm grateful to know so many of you share in this belief and are willing to get involved. Please remember to visit our website and utilize the free resources that we've designed to help you better protect the children in your lives. And follow us on social media. Help us raise awareness of missing and exploited children in your community. We have a lot of children and family counting on all of us. Kendall Ray, thank you again for caring about children everywhere. And to all of you for your continued support. We could never do our work to protect children without you. Michelle is so awesome. I got to meet her when I was in DC at the NECMEC headquarters and she gave me a whole tour 
of the headquarters and just the work they do is so incredible. One thing I wanted to mention is that in 2022, NECMEC assisted law enforcement families and child welfare with 27,644,000 cases of missing children. And the overall recovery of NECMEC cases was 88%. And again, that's 2022. And the report for 2023 will come out soon. So I will share that information when it's available as well. If you would like to help us reach our next goal, which is, like I said, half a million dollars, you can check out our most recent NECMEC hoodie. It's available right now in all sizes at kendallray.shop. And as always, 100% of the profit is donated directly to NECMEC. So you can treat yourself while also feeling good about it. And of course, I am planning new designs for the new year. But anyway, let's go ahead and jump into this case. We're going to be talking about Valerie Tyndall. So like I said, I have been following Valerie's case since it first broke in June of last year, and there have been some major developments since. And like I said, hopefully justice is right around the corner for Valerie. And she was only 17 years old, so it's certainly not easy to talk about, but I know that stories like hers are so important to tell. So let's start out by talking a little bit more about Valerie and the amazing young woman she was, and what an incredible future that she had ahead of her. Valerie was born on August 29, 2005 in Indianapolis, Indiana. She was the daughter of Jack Tyndall and Sheena Sandifer, and she had one brother and three sisters. So it's not exactly clear when this happened, but eventually they decided to move out of Indianapolis Sadly, Valerie had experienced trauma at a very young age, and her mom felt it was best for their whole family to move somewhere safer. So they packed up and moved to Arlington, which is less than an hour out of the city. It's a much smaller area. It has a population of about 300, give or take a few. And yeah, when a lot of people move to smaller places like that, it's in hopes that it's going to be a safer community. They really hoped that living more of a small town life would ease some of their concerns and make for a safer childhood for all of them. But sadly, even in this small town, violence still found this family. Specifically, it found Valerie. So last summer, summer of 2023, was shaping up to be a really good summer for Valerie. She was 17 years old. She had just finished her junior year of high school at Rushville Consolidated High School, and she was really looking forward to being a senior, of course. And junior year was a big year for her. She ended up really excelling in school. She went from struggling quite a bit and failing classes to getting all A's and B's. So the future was looking much brighter for her. One thing I loved learning about Valerie is that she truly loved animals and she had big dreams of one day becoming a vet. And she was actually already in the process of pursuing that dream and was applying for colleges, but she would never be able to fulfill that dream because of what happened on June 7th, 2023. So June 7th was a Wednesday, and obviously it was summer, so she wasn't in school. And Valerie had a very strong work ethic. At 17, she was already working multiple jobs. So she asked her mom if it would be okay if she worked that Wednesday, even though she typically didn't. And on this particular Wednesday, she was referring to working a job that she did for her neighbor's lawn care business. Now, this neighbor was 59-year-old Patrick Scott. Now, Patrick and his family lived on a large property across the street from Valerie's family, and I can only imagine that that's how the two of them met, sheerly based on proximity. And like I said, he owned a lawn care business that Valerie worked for. But based on all the reporting in this case, Valerie and Patrick's relationship was not just a working relationship. The two of them were friends. Patrick had absolutely no business being close friends with a 17-year-old girl who he also employed. And I know it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Valerie obviously is not at fault or to blame here. It is obvious that he was grooming her and that she was a victim of him even before he did what he did. And yes, her parents did know that Valerie spent time with Patrick but again, she did work for him and she was also close friends with his granddaughter. Plus, you have to consider that he wasn't just some strange neighbor that the family didn't know. They were actually friends. The two families spent a lot of time together, according to Valerie's mom, Sheena. But there are monsters out there. Sometimes people that 
come across as very friendly. I mean, monsters like Patrick Scott, who manipulate people into making them believe that they are a good person when they're not. And clearly that's what Patrick did. He manipulated their family into believing that he had Valerie's best interest in mind. But as I've alluded to, after she went missing, it started to become clear that she was spending time alone with just Patrick and he did not have her best interests in mind. However, what still isn't clear in this case is exactly how much time they were spending together alone outside of work and what they were doing during those times. What we do know, based on one report out there, is that after Valerie disappeared, there were photos found in her room of her and Patrick together alone at the aquarium. That same report says that her parents actually knew about this aquarium visit and they even allowed her to go, but only because they were under the impression that it wasn't going to be just the two of them. They thought his entire family was going to be there. And as a reminder, she was very, very close with Patrick's granddaughter. But based on the photos and the fact that nobody else is in them, it does appear that they were alone. And I imagine her parents wouldn't have allowed this if they knew that was going to be the case. Now, Sheena does say that there were times where Patrick came across as a jealous boyfriend, but she also says that Valerie sort of always eased her concerns about Patrick. Now, I don't want to get in too deep or speculate too much about how the family felt about Patrick and this strange relationship. Also, because a lot of that information just isn't out yet. Hopefully, we will be learning more in the upcoming months. We do, however, have information about what happened on June 7th. So let's get back into that. So that night, obviously, Valerie was supposed to spend the day working for Patrick and she didn't come home. So obviously, when her daughter didn't come home, Sheena got concerned and she called Patrick to ask if he knew where she was. But when she talked to Patrick, he said that not only did she not work that day, but they didn't even have plans for her to work that day at all. Now, obviously, this was shocking to Sheena, but At first, her mind didn't jump to the worst case scenario. Maybe she lied about working that day and that she actually had plans to do something else. So she figured and probably hoped that Valerie actually had plans to hang out with some friends or possibly some boys and would hopefully be back soon, if not by the next morning. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And that night, actually, on the 7th, Patrick and his wife, Linda, came over to their house and Patrick started talking to them about the idea that maybe Valerie ran away. And of course, at that point, Sheena really started to become concerned. I mean, here's this person starting to put ideas in her head that her daughter ran away, sort of seemingly jumping the gun at this point. And that would obviously concern anyone. And eventually, Sheena would learn that Patrick was only trying to steer her away from the truth. And the truth was that Valerie did not run away. Valerie was murdered, and Patrick was responsible. Valerie Tyndall was officially reported missing the following morning, June 8th. And two days later, the Indiana State Police issued a silver alert stating that she was last seen on June 7th around 12 p.m. and is believed to be an extreme danger. Rush County Sheriff's Department is asking for your help finding a missing 17 year old. This is Valerie Tyndall. She is missing from Arlington, Indiana. She was last seen around noon on Wednesday. The Sheriff's Department says she is believed to be in extreme danger. She is five feet, six inches tall, weighs about 160 pounds with brown hair and hazel eyes. Valerie was last seen driving a green 2000 Honda Accord with an Indiana license plate, it's on your screen, ZYK833. Anyone with information is asked to call the Sheriff's Department at the number on your screen or just call 911. And right off the bat, there was major concern for Valerie from law enforcement and the public. And the initial search efforts started right away. And part of those initial efforts, of course, involved questioning Patrick. I mean, after all, he was the person that Valerie said she was going to be spending the day with, the day that she disappeared. But when he was questioned, of course, he tells investigators that he didn't see Valerie at all on the 7th and that the last time he saw her was on the 6th. However, it did not take investigators long to figure out that he was lying. And that's because a witness actually saw Patrick and Valerie together on the 7th. 
And witnesses even said that they saw Patrick driving Valerie's car. But I'll get more into that in a moment. And of course, when Patrick was confronted with all this information, he changed his story. Big shocker there. And of course, that's always a big red flag when we cover cases and we hear that someone changes their story. Very often, that means that they are trying to hide something. I mean, literally 99% of the time, that's the case. And this time, Patrick says that yes, they were together on the 7th, but that he dropped her off in Homer, which is about 10 minutes down the road from Arlington. And he claims he didn't see her again after this. And during several interviews that took place in June, this is what Patrick had to say. He said that on the 7th, he and Valerie first met up in Shelbyville at the South High Gardens condominiums and that they left together in his work truck. And while driving, Patrick claims that Valerie asked to be dropped off in Homer, where he says that she then got into a pale blue car with an unknown male and that the two of them started driving off in the direction of Rushville. But then Patrick changed his story yet again in later interviews and said that after they met up at the condominiums, she got into his work truck and that the two of them drove back to his place. And in this version of events, he said that he left Valerie at his house while he went out to work for the day. And when he came home, she was gone. Now, the part of this version that makes it a little bit more believable than his first version is that phone records show Valerie's last location was in the Arlington area. And remember, Arlington is where Patrick and Valerie lived. So if she really did take off in some guy's car, then her location likely would have been Homer or somewhere else. Now, obviously, we all know that Patrick is still lying in this version of events because he didn't go to work that day, but it does line up with the location data of Valerie being at his house on the day that she disappeared. And location data isn't the only valuable thing that was recovered from the cell phone records. In fact, Patrick actually gave his cell phone over to police and allowed them to search it. And in his phone, they found the last text message that Valerie sent him. It was at 11.23 a.m. on June 7th, and the message reads, I'll be there soon. And as for Patrick's messages, he sent her two texts, one at 5.40 p.m. on the 7th and the other at 2.46 p.m. on the 8th. And both of these times, he was asking where she was. And obviously there was no reply. Now, all of this information is valuable for two reasons. One, it confirms beyond a reasonable doubt that Patrick and Valerie were together that day. And two, we know that Patrick didn't need to ask Valerie where she was because he knew where she was. Get this. This is absolutely insane. But Sheena says that Patrick had her daughter's location shared with him on the Life360 app, which is so, so bizarre, and that he was constantly checking on her location. But if that was the case, and he really did have her location available to him at any time, why would he need to text her and ask where she was if he could just pull up his app and look for himself? And I'm sure many of you are thinking the same thing as me, that the reason for this was to set up some sort of alibi or distance himself from Valerie on the 7th. However, even though it is incredibly creepy that he was able to track her location like that, it isn't illegal for him to do that. So investigators still had no way to make an arrest at this point. But the good news is, is they did have enough information to arrest him for something else. By the end of June, Patrick had misled investigators with false information on several occasions, and he was charged with a misdemeanor count of false informing. And even though this was something, it wasn't the something that they truly wanted. They wanted to know where Valerie was. They wanted to find Valerie, and they just knew that Patrick was somehow involved. So weeks and then months went by, and there was still no sign of Valerie, but investigators were far from giving up. In fact, they were getting closer and closer to finding her each day. And that brings us to October 11th, 2023, when investigators finally were able to do a search of Patrick's property and they brought cadaver dogs with them. And interestingly, four dogs individually alerted to the scent of human remains at the property's pond. But when they searched, the pond turned up empty. And when asked, 
The dog's handlers said it's very possible that the wind carried the scent of remains and it landed where it did because water is actually really good at capturing odor. And knowing this, investigators ordered a topography study of the property, which took place the following day with the help of helicopters. And in doing this aerial search, investigators would be able to see if there were any disturbances in the land or anything to indicate where the scent of human remains was traveling from. And they did end up noting multiple areas of obvious ground disturbance. But then things went quiet for a few weeks and Valerie was still considered missing and there was no indication of how close they were to finding her. Thankfully though, investigators weren't giving up and seven weeks after the initial search, they conducted another search. On Tuesday, November 28th, 2023, local and federal agents converged on Patrick's property focusing their efforts on a large dirt pile covered in miscellaneous debris. And it was there, buried under pounds of dirt, that investigators discovered two wooden boxes. And I'm sure you have a pretty good guess at what was inside at least one of these boxes. The first contained paperwork and VHS tapes, which I will talk more about in a moment. And the second box gave off a smell that told them exactly what they were going to find. Inside that second box, wrapped in black plastic, was Valerie's body. Valerie had on orange fingernail polish, and that was immediately identified as the same polish that she was seen wearing in a social media post from the day that she disappeared. Now, I can't even imagine the mixed emotions that everyone who loved Valerie was feeling. You know, the relief, but also the horror and devastation, finally knowing that she was gone. I mean, yes, they found Valerie and that was their goal. They knew that they would probably not find her alive, but God, it would just be so painful to get that information no matter how prepared. I mean, how can you even be prepared for that? I just, my heart truly breaks for them. But the good news here is that Patrick was finally able to be arrested. He was arrested immediately and taken to the Rush County Sheriff's Office where he actually made a full confession. A tragic end to the search for a missing teenager in the small town of Arlington. The Rush County coroner officially identified the remains found on Tuesday as Valerie Tyndall. The 17 year old was reported missing in June. The remains were found on her neighbor's property and tonight that neighbor Patrick Scott is in jail facing a murder charge. Now, I'm going to be going over the details of his confession, but I want to issue a trigger warning here that it's obviously very upsetting, not only the circumstances of how he killed her, but also why. During an official interview, Patrick confessed to strangling Valerie with the belt that he had been wearing on June 7th. And this is truly disturbing, but he claims that he continued to wear that belt after using it to kill her. (laughs) It's hard to even wrap your mind around someone who would do something like that. It turns out that on June 7th, Patrick and Valerie did, in fact, meet up at the condominiums in Shelbyville. And it was there that a witness actually overheard him telling Valerie that he was going to take her out to a special lunch in Indianapolis. Now, this conversation occurred just a few hours before it's suspected that Valerie was murdered. And there is no evidence to indicate that this special lunch ever actually occurred. In fact, police records indicate that Patrick drove Valerie back to his home by 12.59 p.m., and any and all activity on her phone ended shortly before that. And those same police records show that shortly after arriving home, Patrick started deleting apps on his phone. But what he didn't think to delete was his Apple Health app. And the app ended up recording several significant health activities that occurred approximately at 1.35 p.m. And it hasn't been officially confirmed, but I'd be curious to know if that's when all of this happened. But going back to Patrick's confession, he didn't hesitate to explain why he did it. According to his story, Valerie had threatened to blackmail him into buying her a new car. He claims that she was going to tell people that he seduced her and he wasn't going to let that happen. He then explained how they got into a pushing and shoving thing and that he didn't know what to do with her while that was happening. And when he was asked if he had planned on killing her when all of this went down, he said no. 
it kind of just happened, which is just absolutely infuriating. I mean, it kind of just happened. You kind of just killed her. No, you fucking killed her. A 17-year-old girl with a whole life ahead of her and, and big plans and dreams, you ripped her away from everything and her family. And that is not something that just kind of happens. And I'm sure you all will agree with me that the way he seems to answer all of this so casually, like it's not a big deal. It's just sort of happened. It was an accident. It is disgusting. It is hard to even, God, how does someone think like that? It just makes me sick. It's like, it's no sweat off his back that she's dead and that he's responsible for it. So then Patrick tells investigators that he pretty much figured she was dead after all of this happened and that he didn't tell his wife or his family and that, quote, they don't know nothing about it. Then they asked him what he did after he killed her. And he explained that he moved her body from his bedroom to his office where he kept her for an entire day. And then the following day, on June 8th, he goes to Home Depot and buys two by fours for the box that he made to put her body in. And according to the arrest affidavit, it seems like he was actually not that forthcoming when it came to talking about going to Home Depot and buying wood. And this is all kind of confusing because it has been reported by some outlets that he already had the wood on his property, but records show that he did go out and buy it at Home Depot. But either way, the wood was definitely purchased and he used it to dispose of Valerie's body. And as for where he buried her, Patrick said that the hole was already dug on his property where he was planning to put cement. Now hearing this makes me, and I'm sure a lot of you, wonder a few things. First of all, what was he planning to bury under the cement? I mean, does this show that this was premeditated, that he planned on killing Valerie? Or did he have something else that he was planning to bury? And also, I'm sure you're all feeling the same way, but I am super sus about these VHS tapes. This happened in 2023. Who still has VHS tapes? I mean, of course some people do, but if you have them and you want to get rid of them, why not just throw them out unless there is something bad on these tapes that he wanted to be hidden forever. Even though he has confessed, I mean, we know that he murdered Valerie at this point. There are still so many unanswered questions here. And I hope that we get those answers in the next couple of months, at least by the end of the year. A new police report is revealing details about an Arlington teen's final moments, according to her accused killer. 59-year-old Patrick Scott told police he drove Tyndall back to his home on June 7th, where he says she tried to seduce him and he, quote, wasn't going to have it. He went on to say that's why he strangled Tyndall with a belt he was wearing, wrapped her in black plastic, and left her body in his home office while his family went about their evening. The report says Scott detailed putting Tyndall in a homemade wooden box the next day before burying her on property he owned. That's where officials were searching and eventually found her body this week. In the meantime, though, we do know a few things that I want to share with you all, specifically about Valerie's car. I mentioned earlier that on the day Valerie went missing, a witness says that they saw Patrick driving her car, and it turns out that he did. Patrick admitted to moving her car to a different apartment complex and even admitted that he got rid of her license plate and her keys by throwing them into a river so they wouldn't be found. Now, to this day, those items have not been found, and Patrick claims that he forgets which river he threw them into. Now, some other information did come out during his confession, and that has to do with his and Valerie's relationship. Patrick denies that the two of them were ever romantically involved, keyword denies, but he did say that they would spend time together outside of work, such as going shopping and going out to eat. And he even said that he was planning on getting her new car because hers was breaking down, but that she wanted a brand new car and he wasn't going to be able to do that for her. And lastly, I have to share this insane little detail about his confession. When he was asked if he was bothered by the fact that he killed her, killed someone that he claimed to be friends with, you want to know how he responded? He said, I wasn't too crazy about it. I'm sorry, what? I mean, that alone, on top of everything else, just confirms what a true monster Patrick really is. And her family agrees. His attitude and just like nonchalance about the whole thing is 
it's like revolting. It's, God, it is hard to believe that there are people like this out there. So in a press conference that occurred on November 29th, a day after her body was found, Valerie's parents spoke out for the first time. They talked about their confusion, about how he could have done this to her, and how he completely avoided their family in the months that followed her disappearance, and so much more. And I'm going to play part of it for you here because I think it's important that you hear it directly from them. Where are you at right now? This has got to be unbelievable for your family. I'm devastated. My daughter didn't deserve this. You know, we just want answers right now. We just want answers as to why. Why would you do this? She worked for him, right? They did. She worked for him. But she also hung out with his family, like his granddaughter was her friend. And we went places with them, me and him, and her and him, and family. Like everybody went together. For a long time. You guys were family friends. Yeah. In the last five months, had you talked to him about her at all, or did you see them at all? No, he ran his house every time I tried to talk to him. Well, at first, actually, the first um, week or so, I think it was the first week, right after we hung flyers. I think it was day two, we went out and hung flyers. And as soon as we came home, they were there. And they kept coming over, you know, asking me if I was okay and telling us, oh, I'm sure she's fine. She'll be back home. I left at 17, that's what his wife kept telling me. I left at 17, and I said, yeah, but that was different. You left and got married. Your mom knew where you were. You didn't just vanish. Did you know in your mother's heart this is not her running away, that this is something is my child? I think I hoped, so I hung on to that. I wanted to believe that she did, but I didn't. (laughs) To know that she was found practically in your own backyard, I mean, it's devastating. My heart, it was for me. Yeah, mind blowing. I want to go over there so bad. So much. Every day. How are you still standing up? I do not know. It ain't easy. I've been up all night. Crying with the hospital crying. Is she your oldest? Or no, me? she's my middle. Middle child. How would you describe her? <laughs> so sweet and smart. Funny. Funny. Very intelligent. She, and she, I uh, saw something you said she was getting her grades up. She was. She was. She went from trauma. failing to uh, getting A's and B's. I was so proud of her, but I never got to fail her She even got a couple <laughs> acceptance letters from college. She was applying to college. Do you know what she wanted to do? What she, Pet did. she wanted to be a vet. Yeah, she loved animals. And her schoolwork and her folder proved that. She had all kinds of paperwork filled out from schooling where she was studying animals. And Valerie's mom also shared that Patrick was doing some really sketchy things in the weeks following her disappearance. One example of these sketchy things, which is honestly beyond sketchy, is he was seen burning down his garage after Valerie went missing. And this ended up being in the same area where Valerie's body was found. So I can't help but think, and I'm sure you agree, that he was getting rid of more evidence. I mean, why else would he just randomly burn down his garage? Of course, I have to say allegedly and that he's innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, but you know how I feel and I'm sure all of you feel the same. And like you just heard, he was completely avoiding their family, which is a big change considering the first night that she was missing, he went over there and acted all concerned about her. And again, just the fact that he acted so nonchalant about everything just, ugh. It's truly disgusting. Makes me sick. And he didn't just murder her. He left her sit in that house. In a gut-wrenching moment of clarity. (sighs) Valerie Tyndall's mom and dad, Sheena Sandifer and Jack Tyndall, broke down in tears multiple times as they spoke to me for more than an hour, going over the gruesome details in their 17-year-old daughter's murder. It's the way he described everything so no artlessly. There was no, it was like it was not even a human He's being worked, speaking. She's worked for him for two years and he, there's no remorse yeah. at all. I went from being sad to now I'm just angry. I'm so angry. And I won't stop until there are answers. Jack and Sheena told me they never suspected their neighbor or someone they considered a friend would do this. They said Scott even consoled them after Tyndall disappeared and that Scott and his wife Linda spoke to them the day after we now know Tyndall was murdered. It's a conversation they say they'll never forget. But they were definitely picking brains. You could tell they were trying to kind of steer us in their direction. Guiding. They wanted us to believe that she ran away. And tonight, they have a strong message for Scott. He's a freaking monster. You're heartless, soulless, 
you're a demon and God will make you pay. I mean, the whole case is just beyond heartbreaking. Valerie's celebration of life occurred on December 9th at the Arlington Christian Church. And God, I can only hope it brought her family some sort of comfort. Valerie has been described, as I said, as a really incredible person. She was sweet. She was kind. She was a hardworking girl who loved spending time with her friends and playing video games and singing, you know, typical things that a lot of teenagers do. And I just hate thinking about the fact that someone who she trusted, someone who she thought cared for her, could do something like this to her. But he did. And I can only hope that he spends the rest of his miserable life behind bars, that the absolute max possible punishment is put in place for Patrick. So at the time that I'm recording this, the trial is set to occur in April of 2024, so just a few months from now. But as you know, oftentimes trials can be delayed, things happen, and it's very hard on the family when that does happen, when they have to wait even longer for justice. And I just hope that things go as planned and that the whole trial is as quick and smooth and as pain-free for them as possible, which I know that's impossible. It's going to just be so re-traumatizing for them, but I hope in the end, justice is served. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, today I wanted to make a donation to the Anti-Predator Project in Valerie's honor. Their mission is to combat human trafficking and sexual predators in the United States through the use of trained private investigators. They're truly an amazing organization. They provide investigative and protective services for victims and also work to educate communities about the realities of these tragedies. Although Valerie wasn't specifically a victim of trafficking, she was the victim of a predator who groomed her and took advantage of her. And I hope by sharing programs like these, they will get more support and we can all be a part of a future where children are safe from predators like Patrick Scott. We'll be sure to keep you guys updated on Valerie's case, either in the comments on this video or the description box, or if you give me a follow on Twitter, which is at Kendall Ray on YT, um, I will post it there. I will definitely be looking out and, you know, just hoping that this family gets justice as quickly as possible. And I'm confident there will be justice for Valerie. I wish I had more information for you guys. I wish I had the ending that we all want, that final justice, you know, to feel like there is that last bit of closure. But unfortunately, we're just not there yet. I just know that it's it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But I will be back next week um, to discuss another case. And until then, please stay safe out there. Mm -hmm.